All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. This is the or evening if you're in the Western Hemisphere, morning or afternoon if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, welcome to the fifth of eight webinars that the XX Network team is hosting this month. Our topic today is token economics and governance. If this is the, your first exposure to the XX Network, we welcome you and recommend that you also check out our first webinar, which gives more of a full overview of our technology. You can find that on YouTube under the Praxis uh, YouTube account. Uh, we also encourage you to read the XX Network white paper. You can, I, I shared a link in the chat box here for this webinar. So we are very excited to share the XX Network with you guys uh, and, and to all, everyone in the public. Uh, in these webinars, we're presenting technology that we've been working on for months, and in some cases, many years. And we think the XX Network represents real breakthroughs in providing privacy, speed and scalability, and security that's going to empower ordinary users at worldwide scale. And so we're really excited to be here this evening, and we thank you for joining us. And for those of us, those of you joining us live, we have two simple ground rules. First is that we ask that everyone treat each other with respect. We welcome and are excited to have a great exchange of views this evening, but we just ask that that be done respectfully. And the second rule is in this forum, uh, we're not able to discuss the XX coin public scale, public sale. There are some opportunities for that elsewhere, but right here, we're focused on the technology. And so along with that, nothing you hear tonight should be interpreted as investment advice or a solicitation to purchase any kind of financial product. So the agenda for tonight is uh, our team is gonna share for about 45 minutes, and then we're looking forward to taking your questions. Uh, for those of you joining us live at the bottom of your window, you'll see a Q&A box and also a chat box. And so you can ask questions as they strike you throughout the evening uh, or throughout the, the webinar, and then we're gonna kind of group those questions and answers to the end. So with that said, let me introduce you to the team joining us this evening. First, we've got myself, Peter Somerville. Uh, I'm the head of Node and Developer Relations at Praxis. And so if anyone uh, listening in here is a Node operator or a developer of distributed apps or dApps, I would love to be in touch with you. Also joining us this evening is Dr. Richard Carback. Uh, Rick has a great background in cryptography and he's also spent nearly 15 years doing research into voting systems, often collaborating with David Chom, our CEO and founder. Uh, and also joining us is Benjamin Winger. Ben is our, the VP of architecture at Elixir. He has really led the team that's put together and, and deployed the AlphaNet that hopefully many of you guys have had a chance to try out with the XX Messenger. Um, and so delighted to have Rick and Ben joining us this evening. Um, and so let's set the stage for the topics we're gonna to cover tonight. Uh, on this next slide, gives you sort of an overview. And tonight we're honing in on two topics, governance and token economics. And so before we really dive into the details, let's talk about why these two topics really matter. The XX network is designed to be a decentralized network. That means that by the time we launch the mainnet, uh, in addition to really world-class cryptography and consensus mechanisms, we also need rules for how members of the network will work together to keep the network running, hopefully for many years to come. So tonight we're focusing on two types of those rules. First, we need rules about how this decentralized network is gonna make decisions together. And second, we need rules about how we make this decentralized network financially sound. So governance is really about decision making. The XX network is again going to be decentralized with decisions based around voting. And so that means we need to really carefully design that voting system to protect against manipulation. Things like faking the count of the votes or folks coming in and buying the votes of members of the network or civil voters, folks creating a bunch of kind of fake accounts to, to flood the ballot box. And then we also need to make sure that voters, members of the network 
are motivated to actively participate in that and drive that decision making process or else the system's just going to grind to a halt. So we'll get into governance and token economics in turn is about the financial carrots and sticks, the motivations that keep the network running and make sure that participating in the network makes financial sense for everyone involved. And so, for example, node operators, they're going to be spending money to run their servers. We need to make sure that that's financially worthwhile for them over the long term. And so we need to think about the token economics of the network. And that means focusing on the initial growth or bootstrapping phase, thinking about the economics of how users send messages and payments through the system, looking at the loop or the cycle of coins as they make their way through the network, then also talking about how network growth affects those numbers. If we get these topics right, the XX network will run smoothly for the benefit of everyone for many years to come. And this is where we really welcome your input. If you see a future trouble spot that you think we haven't really addressed with, with our work in these areas, please let us know. Uh, again, you've got a, a Q&A and chat box at the bottom of your webinar screen. And then also we welcome you to communicate with us on Telegram or Discord. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Ben uh, to get started talking about governance. Thanks, Peter. So as we said, um, governance is going to cover a few topics. We're going to talk about random sample voting, decoy ballots, a process called ball uh, ballot tournaments, and then electoral minority protections. Uh, through this process of, before we discuss this, I want to kind of frame it. What is governance? Why do we have governance? Why is it so important? And why is it so hard? So as we said in the white paper, Governance is the process for making decisions. Uh, centralized networks like the XX network don't have a way to make choices, um, you know, natively, code is code, and it needs human beings to uh, interact in that mechanism to make those decisions. And governance is the process by which people do that. And the hope is that we can build a governance system which is egalitarian, secure, verifiable, private, and incentivizes participation. So, Okay, what are they participating in? And so I'm quickly gonna cover the things that governance does in the XX network. Uh, so the first and most obvious thing is they can change the software, uh, make it so it does different things, improve the efficiency, add updates, um, add features. Um, in the XX network, uh, they add nodes to the network, so nodes uh, have to be approved by governance, and in certain events, they can remove nodes from governance, although this is designed to be relatively difficult. Um, they can also add additional mechanisms for user authentication, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. It's also important to note that not all decisions are equal. Some are harder, some are easier, and some also may require alternative proposal requirements, which we'll also get into during this uh, presentation. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand off to uh, Rick to kind of get into really the mechanics of how we do these things with random sample voting and decoy ballots. Thank you, Ben. So the XX Network's random sample voting system is designed to solve the problems that we're seeing in existing blockchain networks. For example, voter turnout is low in some of these networks because the topics are quite complicated, especially things like code changes, or voting happens too frequently. There's too many issues all at once. We've also seen a lot of sites uh, for different networks where you can sell your vote for some. Uh, amount of tokens in the network or a different currency altogether. And in general, a lot of the networks seem to be dominated by small players who may or may not have the best interests of the network at heart. So we're seeing systems where key decisions are heavily influenced, for example, by an exchange uh, because they happen to support and hold a lot of the, that network's token. We're seeing developers make decisions with very little input from the community and just pushing the change out. In other cases, we are seeing network forks, and while forking is sometimes necessary, the systems in place to fork don't have a good way to poll to generate an authoritative answer for the community's preferences. So instead, you have big players that control all the narrative, 
and no one really knows the truth of what the majority of the network participants really care about. So summarizing that, the sample voting is designed to increase voter turnout, give the community an authoritative view of their own preferences, and minimize the possibility of forking. Next slide. And so to do that, we're basing the XX network sample voting on the random sample voting project of which David, our CEO, is a founder and a leader. And that team just recently had their first binding polls at the World Forum for Democracy. This is a picture from that event. And it's very exciting tech. It's an extremely uh, well-baked set of technology. It's based on a lot of prior technology. Can you go to the next slide, please? And that's, you know, it, it's just not the first time that this kind of technology has been used. So predecessor technologies, including Scantegrity and PunchScan, uh, have been used in a lot of different places in addition to the World Forum for Democracy and the four test, network, uh, test elections of random sample voting. It's been used in Tacoma Park, Maryland for their binding elections. Uh, that was Scantegrity. And it's been used at the International Association for Cryptographic Research. Both the random sample voting and Scantegrity has been used there. And I believe PunchScan as well. It's been used at schools, it's been used at conferences, and it's been used at various professional societies like the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. Next slide for me. And if you don't believe us, why don't you talk about, let's you know, go research in the community. And this is a list of a bunch of papers that are not from our group or from the random sample voting group that talk about uh, random sample voting in parts of the system that we feel are important. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the background behind the technology. So it provides for both a secure and a private secret ballot vote. Our system really takes advantage of the fact that we have lots of voters. And normally this situation might devolve into just rich guys or those with access to the most resources in control, like you might find in other blockchains. This is because they would ruin it by buying or selling votes or controlling the narrative. But we solved this through decoy ballots, which enables a more equitable system similar to a one person, one vote approach. It works by allowing users to request a decoy ballot and receiving a proof of decoy. The decoy ballot looks and acts like a real ballot. So you can record your entire voting session to sell to potential vote buyers. Because the buyer can't tell if your vote is real, this destroys the market for vote buying. And if you don't believe, believe us, you can check out the paper by Parker's that's in that second bullet point. Uh, sorry, by Parks. <clears throat> Only the proof of decoy can tell if your vote is real, allowing you to be sure that the ballot is a decoy. Unlike in, polling, in a polling place where, you gen where you're geographically local to all of your fellow voters, where someone might be able to completely intercept the entire process, it's prohibitively expensive to do that in our case, since all the voters are decentralized across the world. And lastly, this is all built on top of a voter verifiable end-to-end -end cryptographic voting system. We've deployed these systems in binding elections, as I mentioned in the previous slide, Tacoma Park. They work by posting an audit trail online before the election, and then they use commitments with one-way functions or hashes in ways that are very analogous to our payments platform our payment system. They prove that the ballots will be recorded as cast through a pre-election audit and ballot spoiling, and they prove that the ballots will be counted as cast through a post-election audit. Can we get the next slide, please? So random sample voting more generally works by using an unmanipulatable random selection of voters for anything that requires a vote. And there are a few examples of this, with the key being that the results are not predictable ahead of time. Uh, for example, the NIST random beacon, which is a standard for generating randomness that supports a publicly verifiable external variable variables in the entropy pool. There's also the stock market. You can set a date in the future and say the, stock, the closing stock market values in this, at this certain time in the future. That happens to be always publicly verifiable. And what we plan to do is use the data from the network blockchain itself. Our governance leverages random sample voting both to scale in terms of the number of decisions that we can make as well as their complexity. 
And we believe that this model works really well for blockchains, where the change in future requests are complex and can happen very frequently. This random selection of voters can form a subset of users that can really sink their teeth into any issue. First, because they know that their vote will really matter because they are part of a small subset and that their vote will really matter for the network. And second, because we incentivize voting using techniques like a lottery payment, which we know will work due to the high participation rates that you find in most democracies. Uh, in those cases, they happen to use lotteries to take money from the poor, but in our case, uh, we're using them to incentivize voting. And the random selection also helps minority interests that are critical to the network's function, like node runners and those paying fees on the network. Since these groups are clearly defined, we can limit some types of votes to these subgroups, which I find very valuable. Let's talk a little bit more about the decoy ballots on the next slide. So the decoy ballots at a fundamental level really destroy the market for vote selling. Remember what I said before, where the voters are de geographically distributed. That makes it very difficult to do any sort of coercion because you, you know, you can't go and find them at their workplace. You may or may not be able to find out where they live. It's very unlikely that you're gonna have the resources to conduct any kind of large scale coercion attack like you would if it were a local election for mayor, for example. And the second thing is that if you give the voters ability to receive fake ballots, it becomes impossible to trust whether someone trying to sell you their vote is actually selling you a real ballot or not. And while decoy ballots look like the real thing, the difference here is that there's a proof that they're fake. And the way we handle, <clears throat> that's the way we handle preventing count, the accidental counting of a decoy ballot. And to handle real ballots, there's a separate set of proofs for these are the ballots that will be counted and these ballots have been verifiably delivered to the real voters. Next slide, please. So a current challenge in the existing decentralized networks and really just social governance generally is identifying the issues that are most important to the community. To solve that, we use ballot tournaments. And this is somewhat familiar with the DAO, the DAO process, the DAO process, although it pre, predates it by several years. And in the DAO process, they use these prediction markets and they bubble up with the vote on. And this has a lot of similarities to what we're doing, except we also le leverage random, random sampling, and that significantly cuts down on the influence you see in prediction markets by larger players. And so our plan, and it also enables us to bubble up these issues at a much faster pace. So let's talk a little bit about publicly verifiable elections. These are elections where there is a secret ballot that means that people cannot know how you voted and you can't prove how you voted, but we can publicly verify the results of those elections, which is what we, I've been working with on David with David for about 15 years now. And next slide. <clears throat> These end-to-end -end verifiable voting systems provide what's known as an independently verifiable tallies. And what that means is that any voter can verify that her ballot is included in the final tally and anyone can verify that the final tally is correct. So stated another way, an end-to-end -end voting system is concerned with counting exactly what was cast during the election. And the goal here is, dist is distilled into three different properties down below, counted as marked, collected as cast, and counted as cast. And it's somewhat easy to figure out that the, count the cast as marked part is somewhat trivial. If you're using paper, it's, it's making sure that the mark actually, you know, the ink is actually can use, you know, doesn't disappear on you. If you're using a computer, it's a matter of making sure that the vote that gets encrypted and sent over the wire is the one that you encrypted. So there's a decryption and a ballot spoiling process to handle that part. The trick comes in on the counting side, the collected as cast part. Next slide. And this is where traditional voting systems tend to fall down. It's impossible to verify if the ballots are collected during the election are the ones that are actually cast in those systems. And you have limited ability to verify if they were counted as they were collected. If you go check out the random sample voting 
white paper, they explained in detail how this works. And, but the core reason is that as a voter or an election observer, or even an election official, you don't have the ability to witness everything at once. Instead, you're forced to rely on a chain of custody, which we want to get away from. And we provide this verifiable tally to anyone who wants to audit the system and not just privileged observers. So you don't need special privileges to audit an end-to-end -end system. And end-to-end -end systems usually do this in one of two ways. The way that we, we don't use is, is called homomorphic encryption. And what we do use is uh, a hash-based system, which is very similar to the payments, which mixes up a lot of the results, uh, a digital audit trail before the election. And then we audit pieces of that audit trail to perform uh, checks against were the ballots printed properly, were the ballots sent, or not printed, sent out properly, were the ballots received properly, were the ballots counted properly. I believe this one's for you, Ben. Thanks, Rick. So now we're going to talk a little bit about governance impact practice. And what we mean by that is some of the more practical implementation details and rules and how it works and some problems within the XX network. So as we've said, we plan to use random sample voting. And just to reiterate, this allows a small community to make important decisions effectively, um, which means that you know, if there's a small number of voters, you can actually pay them, you can incentivize them. And that drives uh, participation. And there's a multitude of papers which show that under these circumstances, people become more educated and put more effort into making correct decisions because they know their votes are important and they know that they're, um, uh, uh, they're incentivized to actually vote. So what, you know, when we take random sample voting, we're gonna use it in this legislative engine with the idea that every user gets their own vote. And now obviously this is somewhat hard. So our plan, plan is we have this idea of authenticated users, users which were relatively certain don't uh, uh, only have one account. Now when we say relatively certain, what we mean is that, you know, it may be possible to cheese it, maybe say get three accounts, five accounts, but it's not going to be possible to get a thousand accounts, 10,000 accounts. It's not going to be possible to make such a big impact that you can really sway the decision making of the system. So initially we're going to use participation in, in the initial token sales to drive these identities, although we further mechanisms in the work which we'll present as uh, the network matures. So there is another fundamental problem with this, which is that unle uh, one nice thing about systems like a proof of stake or proof of work is that many significant minorities, electoral minorities, decision-making minorities in the group aren't minorities. You know, nodes in Bitcoin are the primary decision makers, which means they can make decisions that best that benefit them. But from a user voting standpoint, the, the portion of the say that nodes have is relatively small. So, uh, so it's possible that they can face what's called the tyranny of the majority. So while many minorities will have better, although imperfect protection, many classical minorities, the network itself generates uh, uh, minorities who have to be protected. Uh, so we've identified two here, which are nodes and consumers of paid postage. And we'll get to postage farther down in the token economics section. And that basically means those who pay to send messages on the platform. But nodes are obvious. They take income from the network, they take inflation, and they take fees. So obviously the uh, user of the network might want to reduce both those things to make the network cheaper for them to use. And then those who pay to use the network might find their fees increasing so that the network can grow faster for the users who don't pay, which again, we'll get into. So there are a few techniques we can use to deal with this. Um, and we're not committing to any at this time. Uh, we think that governance is a far more heuristic process and one which we need significant more community input to make final decisions on. But some approaches will, uh, could be to make so certain pieces of the code that do important things require offset decision-making uh, groups. So for example, you explicitly give nodes a stronger say when you're making changes to economics or their, their specifications. Or you could structure the network as a whole to have different weights. So 
you know, we're going to continue working on this, and we think that solutions are, um, are, are imminent. So now we're going to get into the token economics of the network, and we're going to co uh, cover bootstrapping, how the network starts. We're going to cover postage, which I've already mentioned, and then how that relates to the XX coin, and then kind of take a macro view as how the network as a whole grows. So with bootstrapping, there is, you know, the basic approach we presented is that we're going to have this period with about an average inflation of 2%. And then after this, we're going to drop down the inflation. And the idea here is that when the network has little activity, you need to use inflation to, incent to incentivize the network. But once we hit, um, the network grows and activity uh, comes up, it is that activity which creates kind of a petrol motion machine that funds the network. Um, now, obviously, we're going to be presenting uh, some proposals here on schedules, and they may not occur. And it may be important to alter this. But this is, again, why governance is so important, so you can make informed decisions as the network progresses. So I want to actually cover a different topic quickly, which is why even have inflation in the long term? And the reason why we want to do that is to promote network stability, because even once you have a network that's based upon fees, uh, things still falter, and you want to make sure that the network uh, doesn't uh, suffer stability issues too much uh, uh, when you know, power outages occur or other events occur. And the other is to account for lower nodal liquidity. So as we've said, nodes are voted in through governance, and that process means that becoming a node is harder, so it creates significant disincentivization to stopping a node. And the hardware requiring is a little different than other blockchains, which means that it's, node hardware is less fungible, and the investment that nodes, nodes make is harder to move. To move. So we want to make sure that, uh, it, that nodes have some assurances and we can reduce their risk. So we want to have long-term inflation to ensure to a certain extent they're taken care of. Now, of course, we want to combine this with fees. We want fees to kind of be the big incentivization and big engine of the network. So what follows is a proposal which may change by, by mainnet, provided factors, especially including um, uh, community input. So, the basic inflation schedule that we're proposing is that we've got three years of, um, of higher inflation, and then the uh, inflation uh, uh, drops down over a period of six years to the 0.65% uh, uh, percent number. And uh, here's a general graph of what this would look like. So it's a modest amount of inflation, but uh, it's less than, than uh, many other uh, projects proposed. Um, and here we have, you know, this is the equation that governs that line. It's a, it's a piecewise equation uh, with, with T being in years. And I've got it as well for blocks, assuming a 2.6 second, uh, second block time. Don't expect people to really absorb this. Just want, I don't know, just wanted to show it. Um, so now I'm going to talk about postage. So once the network's up and running, once people are using it, the fundamental network needs to have a mechanism to pay for things that you're getting from it. And so we call this postage. So it's a unit that quantifies the amount of computing power and bandwidth required to transmit data privately across the XX network. And what essentially happens is, is that for the CMX network, users need accounts that they use to negotiate their keys. And these same accounts will keep track of the postage available that, that, they, that they have. So when you send a message and your keys are authenticated, it will also deduct from those accounts. Now, this postage comes in very small denominations, you know, thousands to 10,000 less than the XX coins themselves, because individual messages are extremely cheap. You know, the network makes its uh, uh, revenue because of the massive volume that it can support, thousands and thousands of messages, um, which means that uh, each one is, is quite cheap. Now, of course, most people in their day-to-day -day life don't pay for messaging. And in fact, private communication, we believe, should be the bedrock of much of how we interact in our lives. And that really requires that people have free access to it. Um, not everyone has this, the same resources available to them. And we don't want to lock people out from access to the market. So what, en what ends up occurring is that we have a system where an authenticated account, someone creating an authenticated account, the same type using governance, 
or one can simply burn a small number of XX coins, which will probably vary as the net network grows and changes. And then they get an account which automatically accrues free postage. And this is supposed to be very granular. So you get free postage at a very, very uh, slow rate, but very consistent to ensure that um, if, you, if you run out of it or you run out of um, uh, paid postage, which will cover, you don't have to wait long before you can use the network again. Um, but it's important to know that free postage is limited in the total number, meaning you can't accrue free postage for years and then use all of it. There's a maximum you can accrue. There's also a maximum rate you can use at a time. So if you want to send high bandwidth data through the network, you're going to have to use uh, um, solutions other than just free postage. And that solution is paid postage. So one can purchase uh, postage using their XX coins. Um, we expect that this will be used for payments, which we'll cover on a future slide and for high volume users such as businesses or dApps, um, you know, people who are communicating with many different individuals simultaneously. And as we said before, the cost of each individual message is quite small. It's the volume by uh, which, which makes the total amount large. And also due to the costs, this can uh, be an anti-spam uh, measure at scale. So now I want to talk about what we call the free pay dependency. And it's because when you analyze how businesses or dApps uh, might interact with their customers over the network, you find really interesting economic relationships between free and paid postage. So when a business communicates with a client, that client will often respond with free postage. And this is, of course, what you want. The business doesn't want to have their clients have an additional barrier to working with them. But what this means is that if nodes or if the network stops accepting free postage, it'll stop receiving paid postage because the, the, uh, those businesses who are sending paid postage will have no one to talk to. So this creates a really ni a nice system where simultaneously the two are symbiotic and uh, you know, uh, the tide raises all boats. So increased, um, so, and it ensures that the network as a whole will support free postage for economic reasons, not just for humanitarian reasons. Now I want to talk a little about XX coins and postage, specifically how you send a payment. Now I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I recommend either reading the XX white paper or watching uh, the previous deep dive uh, uh, webinar. Where we're going to more detail as to how private payments are sent. But what ends up happening is to ensure privacy, these payments are split up. Uh, according to, to their individual coins and set separately. And because of the bandwidth, instantaneous bandwidth limitations on the network, what this will result in is a network where when users send payments, they'll end up having to use a little bit of paid postage as well. And this ensures the network itself is paid for the sending of payments. Um, now, this part is still evolving and there might be uh, more information to come but this is where it stands as of right now. So now I want to talk about the XX coin postage loop. And this is the mechanism by which uh, XX coins becomes postage, messages are paid for, and then lock rewards are generated and handed to notes. So you can see the loop on the side and I'm going to start talking about accounts. So when a user has an account and this will contain free postage, which is automatically accrued or paid postage that they paid for. Now, these are on the XX blockchain, and um, uh, these are the same accounts used to send messages on the MixNet. So the authentication process here is the same that's used to send the message. So what happens is a user can send a message through the XX network to the blockchain, which in it has a coin. And instead of using this coin to sign another coin to transfer the money, they use this coin to sign an account. And because they can, um, and what this does is this converts that coin to postage at a set rate and adds that to their account. This process um, is actually really interesting because you can sign any account, which means a business, if they need to have a high bandwidth communication with the client, could hand them the funds required for that communication, or a, um, uh, the business could simply give itself its own funds. So when a message is sent, the postage is deducted from that user's account. So in this case, um, uh, in the example here, the user sent uh, with free postage. So they were able to send a, um, uh, so, and it goes into what we call the virtual pool. 
but it only goes in the virtual pool in the event that it is paid posted. Actually, I apologize, this diagram is a little bit um, confusing. Only paid postage actually enters the virtual pool because um, otherwise free postage would be printing money and it would be kind of right about inflation. Um, so this virtual pool is kind of a buffer. The idea is that um, nodes, when they receive the block rewards after they finish mixing a batch or producing a, a block, but they only do so um, uh, based upon a window of how the network is doing, not based upon the immediate um, uh, results of their block. And this is because the free paid dependency that we discussed, which is so important to the economic health of the system, is a sequential operation, meaning a, most of the time, a business and their client won't be communicating in the same round. So in an instantaneous round, a, um, a team might be able to refuse to process free messages and so for paid messages and in that round increase the revenue. But over time, that would reduce the net revenue network as a whole. So by using an averaging scheme, we better align the um, incentives of the nodes with um, the incentives of the networks. So now we're gonna to get to our last topic, which is growth economics. So if you saw our previous uh, webinar, the technical deep dive, or you've read the Elixir architecture brief, you would kind of have some idea about our scaling. And the fundamental problem, or the fundamental difference in the scaling of this network is that part of it, the XX communication portion is not a blockchain. When you send a message to someone else, you know, uh, say on Telegram, there isn't a strong need for that message to be compared to every other message that's sent simultaneously. It doesn't have what's called a double spend problem, which means the whole network as a whole doesn't have to agree on the messages as they're propagating. And this allows the network to scale in a radically different manner. As more nodes are added to the network, it increases its capacity, as well as its privacy and security. And we can use this as an engine to drive growth in a way that is fairly unique in the blockchain space. So in, the mechanism here is actually a well-worn mechanism. It's a mechanism that has fueled much economic growth you know, in history. And the idea is pretty simple. As more users send more messages, the ge network generates more revenue and can afford to reinvest that to onboard more nodes, which allows more users to send more messages and the loop starts over. And this creates what economists call a virtuous cycle which is a very powerful economic force, which we are really, really excited to be able to leverage in, our, in the XX network. And that's it. Um, you know, I'm gonna hand over to Peter and I think it's uh, probably time for us to answer some questions. <laughs>